President Joseph Kabila came to power in the Democratic Republic of Congo in 2001, taking over from his father, Laurent Kabila, who was assassinated by one of his own child soldier bodyguards. Joseph Kabila was initially credited with bringing relative peace and reviving the mining of the country's vast mineral reserves. But conflicts persist and tens of millions of Congolese people remain trapped in extreme poverty amid widespread allegations of corruption. Kabila's second and final constitutional mandate ended two years ago, but he's stayed in power since amid growing protests and calls for him to step aside. Congolese are finally due to head to the polls on Sunday to choose a new leader. Joseph Kabila, President of the Democratic Republic of Congo, talks to Al Jazeera. President Joseph Kabila of the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, you were due to step down in 2016. Uh, elections were due to be held then, but they've been postponed ever since. First, please explain what's going on. In 2016, uh, elections indeed were supposed to take place uh, in the month of November or December. Uh, unfortunately, due to uh, situations that had arisen uh, in 2012-2013-14, those elections uh, did not take place. Uh, a dialogue was organized and uh, subsequently uh, it was decided that elections take place uh, this year after a concerted uh, dialogue process and of course a government that was put in place with the sole mission or primary mission to organize these elections. So that's why elections are taking place now. But a lot of people are very sceptical uh, about that and sceptical particularly about the recent delays and the recent exclusions. The Catholic Church has said that they doubted the motives of the Electoral Commission. The majority of Congolese, according to opinion polls, don't trust uh, the Electoral Commission. Uh, and a lot of people, particularly among opposition supporters, think that this was all a deliberate strategy by you to try and stay on in power beyond the end of your second and final constitutional mandate. There are so many misconceptions. What you should understand uh, is that the Electoral Commission, the composition of the Electoral Commission in itself uh, does, not, uh, uh, does not give any advantage or advantages to any one composant, meaning you have the majority within the, that Electoral Commission, you have the opposition which is represented in the Commission and of course you have the civil society that hates the Commission, the President of the Electoral Commission. So all this issue or issues about the Electoral Commission being biased uh, to me is just a nonsense. The most important thing uh, which we should all understand and retain is that it is an independent Electoral Commission. So there is no pressure coming from anywhere that uh, should come into play and change the position of the Electoral Commission. Not even the government, not even the Catholic Church, not even the external players. But a lot of Congolese and in particular opposition supporters think firstly the lack of resources that was given to the Electoral Commission was deliberate. They think that many decisions that have led to a situation now where it really appears that the election hasn't been adequately prepared Things such as choosing electronic voting machines which are opaque, uh, prone to complications, that all of these things are deliberate moves that have now brought the country to a position where at best there can be an election that will lack credibility and many people expect to be rigged and at worst that there will be no election at all. Uh, I'd like to correct and rectify one or two things. First of all, the Electoral Commission has never lacked founding. That's not true. The electoral process started way back in 2015 with voter registration, which in itself is a long process, took us two years 
to finish the voter registration process. We currently have 40 million registered voters. Uh, so the Electoral Commission has never lacked uh, funding. Number two, when we talk of uh, voting machines, in fact, I don't even call them voting machines. These are printers. They print the ballot box, the ballot paper rather, uh, which the, the voters <laughs> use uh, in the next phase. So, and of course, this has been an argument that has been used, but I, I, I think that uh, up to now everybody has agreed to the fact that it's going to simplify the voting process, make it much faster. If we had used the ballot papers, we were not going to organize these elections this year because ballot papers were going to cost much more. Uh, we were going to have to transport close to 300,000 tons of ballot papers across the country. And we were going to have double the number of voting stations. Today we have 74,000 polling stations. We're going to have 150,000 polling stations. So there are advantages, disadvantages. And of course, number, number three, if electronic voting, and this is not electronic voting, but electronic voting has been used in very many other countries, why should anybody consider the Congolese as subhuman not being able to use uh, uh, this technology which will simplify the voting process. So it's a nonsense. But more than two years ago, uh, the international community offered financial support to the Democratic Republic of Congo to conduct this election, but that support was rejected. And then later, all of uh, these problems and challenges were cited. But that, again, appeared that there wasn't a political will for an election to take place? Our elections of 2011, we financed those elections to a tune of 85 or 85% 85 of the cost of the election. It was the Congolese state. In fact, it was 85 to 90%. The Congolese state did that. Why is it that we are going to accept any support which, in fact, we did not and do not need in order to finance our own elections. We've always stated that elections in this country is a matter and issue of sovereignty. But you've talked about sovereignty, but I think that's a sovereignty that many Congolese people feel they don't have, in particular the thousands of people who've taken to the streets many times over the last uh, few years, as uh, you know, before and after this election was meant to take place in 2016 and the dozens who were killed and the, the hundreds who were detained uh, in the process of these protests uh, calling for elections, uh, I think they would dispute that uh, they have sovereignty and they say it's sovereignty that they've been demanding. Depends on what uh, your understanding and the understanding of anybody else is of sovereignty. <laughs> I don't think that we have the same understanding. But talking of protests and, and the like, uh, I don't want to go back into what happened uh, in the past. Uh, an electoral process is always a sensitive issue. And I was just stating that even a football game between two clubs, you have tensions that rise. So during an electoral process, you'll have tensions. Uh, the most important thing is to have the necessary police force that's well equipped in order to deal with that. At one given point in time, we did not have that capacity, but we've been building that capacity. And the electoral, or rather, the campaign itself took place with minor incidents. I could have wanted it to have taken place without any incidents, but this is politics. You have such incidents. This is a country with 80 million inhabitants, with 600 political parties with uh, a million views that clash and uh, you're bound to have definitely here and there a number of issues. But that's the past. As for the future, we want these elections to, to take place in a very peaceful atmosphere and uh, for the Congo to move 
forward, fast speed ahead. You talked about incidents in the rallies, but it seems that most of those incidents were at the rallies of uh, Martin Fayulu, presidential candidate, who it seems your ru ruling coalition sees as the greatest threat. He was blocked from travelling to certain parts of the country. One of his rallies was broken up violently by the police. Some people were injured, some people were killed. Uh, and we haven't seen the same in the rallies of Felix Chisichetti, and we haven't seen the same in the rallies of your chosen candidate, Ramazani Shadari. So it really looks like uh, there hasn't been a free and open campaign. The campaign has been free and open. The campaign in this country uh, has a, a period, it's a 30 day period. Some of the opposition candidates started their campaign late. They started their campaign seven days, ten days after the campaign period had already started. But you also had incidents, not only between supporters of the candidate from the majority, but also supporters from within the opposition themselves. But these are, of course, incidents that we regret. But as for those who were killed, I'd like to be very objective and not go into that because we're still waiting for the, the reports from the investigations. But two of the most popular opposition candidates, Moise Gatumbi, Jean-Pierre Bemba, have been blocked from running by courts. Courts which, according to most, to opinion polls, most Congolese don't trust. Courts that most people see as being uh, sided uh, with the ruling coalition uh, and not independent. So two of the most popular candidates haven't been allowed to run. I mean, surely that makes this election lack credibility from its very start. Bear in mind that in this country we have a justice system. It could not be perfect, but we have a justice system. And uh, it's the same justice system that has on a number of occasions given victory left and right to the opposition. We've contested <laughs> on quite a number of occasions uh, and the candidates from the opposition has, have won seats and have also won uh, provinces, you know, two or three provinces. So if you did not contest them then, why contest the decision of the courts now? Over the 18 years that, uh, roughly 18 years that you've been in power, uh, the economy of the Democratic Republic of Congo has more than tripled, uh, but the results of this growth aren't really visible for uh, very many people. Uh, I would say it's been a very unequal growth. Uh, according to the World Bank, more than two thirds of Congolese people are living on less than $2 a day, and this poverty is very visible in the slums that make up very much of the capital, Kinshasa, in the villages up in the hills in the east. I mean, we've been there, we've seen these people, and it seems that most Congolese people are suffering in really grinding poverty while this country sits on trillions of dollars of mineral wealth, and it seems a few people are getting very rich. Isn't this a problem? The problem is the analysis that you're putting forth. Uh, I believe that's the problem. <laughs> the analysis that you're putting forth. Yes, the Congo is a wealthy or potentially a wealthy nation with the huge reserves under the ground. Those reserves have to be exploited. How do you exploit those reserves? It's by bringing in the necessary investments. And when you bring in the necessary investments, that's how you create the necessary jobs for millions of Congolese. And that's how you create wealth for the millions of Congolese. And that's precisely what we've been doing. For the tens of millions of Congolese who are struggling in abject poverty and for those many people who've come to the streets demanding that you leave, uh, I think that they would say the investments that you've delivered in in the 18 years that you've been in office have, have, have been not enough, they've been inadequate because those people are still struggling. Had we had the necessary peace and stability, probably we could have transformed further 
uh, the country. But don't just look at investments in the mining sector. Look at investments in uh, the infrastructures <laughs> that uh, are ongoing, the infrastructure works that we, we have currently ongoing and should continue uh, beyond uh, 2019, beyond uh, the next five years. Uh, so, yes, I accept <laughs> I accept any blame that uh, I will definitely shoulder because I'm uh, the president of this country. But what we have achieved is also a lot, and a lot will definitely be achieved, but uh, with the support of all those that you're talking about, the population that you're talking about. A lot of those people believe that you personally are one of the main beneficiaries of Congo's uh, vast mineral wealth. Uh, is that the case? How much money have you made from your 18 years in control of this country? Uh, when I came into politics, well, it wasn't about money, it was about a mission. Uh, and uh, each and every uh, critic who's been using that same argument uh, left and right has not yet come up to give you the figures that you're asking me to give you. So I believe it's a very subjective question and uh, I don't answer such questions because they're just baseless as far as I'm concerned. In 2016, Bloomberg published an investigation uh, that detailed hundreds of millions of dollars of business interests that Bloomberg said were owned by you uh, and relatives of yours including you know, all kinds of mineral concessions, gold, diamonds, cobalt, hotels, nightclubs, printing of driving licenses, amounting to a vast network of businesses uh, belonging to you and your family. What do you have to say about that? You have, in, um, especially in the West, this cliche about Africans and the African leaders which is a very wrong cliche. I met the fellow who wrote that report two weeks ago, and I asked him, can you provide me? In fact, he came for an interview. I asked, can you provide me with a list of all those assets you talked about? They published it. I mean, it's in, the, it's in their article that they published in 2016. Yes, from one to, to 100, it's just nonsense. It cannot stand in any Code. But in any case, my answer to this question is the Congolese, Congolese have to be the first investors in this country. It's not the Chinese, it's not the Americans, it's not uh, <laughs> the Germans or the British or South Africans, it has to be the Congolese. So wherever you have Congolese investing in their country, they will definitely have the support of the state and we've been encouraging that and we'll continue to encourage that. So since you took over in 2001, in 2003 you were credited with the signing of a peace deal which uh, ended or at least reduced Congo's conflicts at that time. Uh, but here we are uh, about 15 years later and conflicts are still going on. There are more than four million people displaced. There are regular massacres in the east. There's been a, a very brutal conflict in Kasai in recent years. Isn't this a failure to end Congo's conflicts? We don't have anywhere in the Congo, as we speak, a situation of a civil war. But the situation's pretty bad for me, I mean, villagers who are being massacred. You, you asked for you asked you asked a question. Let me give you an answer. Short or long answer depends on you. We have 26 provinces in this country. Not 10, not 11. 26 provinces. Do you know in how many provinces we have problems? In only two out of the 26 provinces, we don't have a situation of civil war. We have, yes, issues with security, especially in two territories, Beni and parts of Butembo. We have issues with security in an area in the province of Ituri. 
and we are dealing with those. But as for the north, North Kivu, and especially the Beni region, and this is on record, we've stated that we're dealing with a terrorist organization. You'd want to present it as, <laughs> as just an armed group, and we've been at loggerheads with the United Nations on this. It's a terrorist organization that attacks UN peacekeepers, has killed uh, not less than 20 in the last year alone. Uh, the population that you're talking about has been massacred by the same elements from the ADF, and uh, it's spreading not only in the Congo, but in the neighboring countries. So I've been these, there. these I've are been there issues. And I've spoken to people there, and they're and they're very skeptical well, about people, the, people the government. They think the government, at best, has failed to protect them, and at worst, many people think the government's actually connected to uh, the people who are attacking and, uh, and massacring them. Did they give you any reason why the government could be implicated? Uh, well, the Congo they Research Group did give reasons on that. They published a paper Con saying Congo that. That, that some of your senior army commanders were among several factions involved in the attacks that are being blamed on the Allied Democratic Forces. Congo Research Group is not an authority in what happened in, in the East, especially in the area around Beni. It's not an authority. I was reading a report, and I've already stated this myself in quite a number of summits that have been held. We don't consider the ADF to be any different from the Al-Shabaab or from Boko Haram or any other radical movement. We have a situation of terrorists attacking civilians to create mayhem, and they've also done it or have also attacked the UN peacekeepers. So whatever doubts, and I do understand the anger from the population, I, I do understand that. I've been there. You probably have been there once. I've been there close to 10, 15 times. I do understand the anger. And uh, our reaction has been to beef up our capacity, to train and retrain <laughs> more troops until we reach the objective of defeating these terrorists. So uh, whatever I said left and right or in any uh, report, is not going to hinder uh, our, our strategy to, to combat this, this terrorism. So if this election takes place as planned, if you step aside as you say you will, what's next? What are you, you. Wh wh why are you so pessimistic? You're talking about if. <laughs> it's no longer about but if. It's been repeatedly postponed already. It People does. are waiting to see no. if, it, if it really will. And will it really happen on Sunday? It has not been repeatedly postponed. The problem is uh, that these are Congolese elections. These are Congolese elections, and that's what uh, everybody has to understand. And there are parameters, there are issues that have risen once in a while, and we've been able to deal with them as a nation. Uh, we don't want anybody to judge us on that, apart from the Congolese people. Uh, elections have been postponed in Afghanistan. <laughs> I don't see anybody talking about that. Elections have been postponed in quite a number of countries. Elections were postponed because of reasons, and reasons have always been given. It has not been uh, a secret reasons have been given. But very I, many Congolese do dispute those reasons. But what I wanted to, to ask you before we finish is, what are, what are your plans after being the president of the Democratic Republic of Congo? I'll answer that question, but uh, I don't want you to, to leave this interview with the misconception that the Congolese people, we have, yes, the Congolese people, but we also have a state. We have a state. So uh, the state has to guide <laughs> the opinion. Uh, and uh, of course, in in quite a number of, uh, of instances where it has been necessary, we've had to deal with our own situations through dialogue that we've done. But as far as I'm concerned and what I'll do after this process, I believe the Congo is much more important than any individual in this country, me included. So uh, first of all, let's organize our elections. As for myself, the sky is the limit. Thank you very much 
for talking. Thank you. Thank you.